So some of you who have not been here before may be a little puzzled by that bridge that was there, but I'm sure everybody who knows anything about history knows that's the most famous bridge in the world. That's the Brooklyn Bridge. And why do we show it? Because the whole purpose of this program is to bridge the incredible advances in physical and particularly biological sciences with human health. And there's a very good analogy. You don't want to hear my lecture on, on the hyperbole of the Brooklyn Bridge. But the main thing is things are never the same on either side of a bridge once you establish it. And the same is true for the kind of communication that we try to establish, particularly between PhD students, postdocs, and so forth, and clinical investigators. So today we're going to talk about, or we're going to hear about, OK, what are you doing? No, I want to go back one, please. Thank you. OK, we're going to talk about transplantation of the human heart and other solid organs. And our two speakers, uh, whom I'll briefly introduce in a moment, is Ali Sklaru, who's a uh, high school student here in the area. And she is uh, telling to speak about her experience. And she is also very active with the Washington Regional Transplant Community and other groups. And Jonah Odom, whom I'll tell you about also in a minute. Now, Jeff, next slide, please. Thank you. Now, a quick uh, schema run through of the extraordinary history of transplantation, particularly for those of you who know a lot about molecular science, but maybe not so much about this, which is one of the more exciting, most exciting ventures. And it's dramatically changed not only human health, but as you'll see, many of uh, it's introduced new areas of science and great advancement. So way back when, uh, even back in Egypt, Egyptian times, there's evidence of transplantation of limbs. So people had the idea. And much of the early 20th century, there was a lot of uh, animal transplantation. But there were no drugs to inhibit rejection. But the technologies were advanced, the surgical technologies, uh, to a great degree. And in 1944, Peter Medawar, who won the Nobel Prize, made the uh, critical discoveries, which I've listed on the website, which for the first time pointed out that the reason why transplantation failed was because of immunologic rejection. This is the dawn of the era of the T cell and the B cell and the concepts of autoimmunity. About 10 years later, <laughs> the first successful uh, transplantation of a solid organ, the kidney, took place at the, Mass General, at the Peter Ben Brigham Hospital. And one of the folks here attending was a nephrology resident at the time who actually dialyzed uh, uh, the patient who had uh, renal failure. And this was uh, successful. This was between identical twins. Very rapidly thereafter, other organs were transplanted. The initial results were not very successful, except that the surgical technology worked, but the patient didn't live too long. And there was a famous lung transplant in Toronto in 67, and then the famous uh, heart transplant by Christian Barnard at Grutesrud Hospital in Cape Town, which you will hear more about from Dr. Odom. And that really kind of opened the floodgates uh, the patient did relatively well, uh, died uh, later of infection. And then Dr. Lilyhai and colleagues transplanted a pancreas. But during all of this period of time, generally, the major drug that was available to suppress immune responses was corticosteroids. And it led to many complications, which I will not go into. And by and large, although it could be effective, there were it was not a long-term situation. But in the early 80s, the FDA licensed cyclosporin, which was the first true uh, 
anti-immunologic uh, rejection uh, agent. And a few years later, Dr. Cosimo at Mass General came up with OKT3, a monoclonal antibody, which suppressed some T cell activities. But in the early 90s, the real breakthrough was this, the discovery of a drug uh, called FK506, which I'll show you in a moment, which turned out to be much more effective than cyclosporin, considerably less toxic, and the mechanism of its action was, became well worked out. And this then revolutionized the change. It was about this time that liver transplantation became really big time under the influence of Tom Starzl, the father of the discipline who was in Colorado and then later set up the big transplant center at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Tom did this as a one-man show. And I remember once being in Colorado with him from the beginning to the end, which was about 16 hours. Uh, and the patient survived and, as far as I know, is doing well. Liver transplant has become a highly uh, successful mode of therapy of chronic liver disease, as, of course, has renal transplant. But we'll hear much more about that. But then big issues arise. The issue of tolerance. Does a patient become tolerant to the graft? And if they become tolerant, can they be removed from anti-rejection therapy, which, if they were to have to take for their entire lives, has many inherent risks that are involved? Tolerance. We'll hear more about this later. Now, with transplantation technically being highly successful, the question is, where do you find the organs? We have two kidneys, so it was not uncommon for somebody in a family who could match, for example, to donate a kidney. We have one liver, but it's possible to split it in half and do a living donor. But they, these are not dealing with the huge health problems that are involved, the demand. And so there's a question of approaches to organ shortages. Xenografting is only spelt with one X. That means the donor is not a human. And there are experiments where they were primates and other species. We'll hear more about that. Right now, there's an effort to try and take animals, particularly pigs, and so program them so that their tissue will not react with the human environment. We'll hear about that. So there's xenografting, there's living donors, and then maybe it's possible to replace these organs by biotechnology. The heart fundamentally is a pump, so in a way you could think that's a little easier than the liver, which is everything. <laughs> and then there's a question of how good are all these things? What's the outcome? What's the long-term results? There have been experiences, uh, Jeff, there have been experiences where multiple organs have been transplanted. I saw a patient a couple of years ago in Holland who had a, a small intestine, a pancreas, a liver, a kidney transplanted in one major operation. Unbelievable that these things are technically possible. Now, a word about FK506. We've gone through this many times in this course about how fungi and bacteria are the source of antibacterial uh, agents, right? The antibiotics. Most of them come from plants, but also do also the drugs which inhibit proliferation of cells. And in this case, uh, FK506, it comes from a soil bacterium uh, which grows on Easter Island, but also in other places. Uh, Easter Island's famous because that's the source of rapamycin, a widely used drug now in cancer therapy. At any rate, FK506 prevents the phosphorylation of nuclear uh, factor activating T cells, <laughs> and it inhibits both the T cell signal transduction and also IL2 transcription. So this is a double barrel positive attack on the rejection phenomenon. Okay. Wow. So, all right. So, our two speakers.
Okay. Our first is Ali Sklaru, and I'm going to just read to you a paragraph of what she sent me. I am a junior in high school in Potomac. I participate in annual winter musicals at my school, the A Capella Group Club, and an after-school program where we use leftover food from lunch to cook food for the homeless. Since middle school, I have been an advocate for organ donation and have worked in unison with local organizations to spread the message. Organizations like the Living Legacy Foundation and the Washington Regional Transplant Community. I've worked at health fairs, given talks to schools, medical professionals, and even been on a float in the Cherry Blossom Festival last weekend in conjunction with the Washington Regional Transplant Community. We admire you without even hearing you. <laughs> and our second speaker uh, is Jonah Odom, who graduated from Yale Medical School, completed surgical residency at the University of Chicago, trained in cardiovascular and thoracic surgery at McGill, uh, where he also received his PhD, and then further training in pediatric and congenital heart surgery at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, he was associate professor of surgery at UCLA, where he was director of the UCLA Heart and Lung Procurement and Preservation Unit. And then he came to the NIH in 2006. He is a senior scientific and medical officer in the transplant immunology branch of NIAID. As an aside, he's a managing editor of the journal eMedicine, one of the favorite journals around here at NIH, and a senior editorial board consultant for the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation. So, Jonah, we're very indebted to you to be here. So, Ali, the podium is yours, and thank you all. Thank you for being here. Is this on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? I guess. Okay, thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. And for my story, I want to explain how organ donation saved my life. So a little bit about my story, why it was such a big, broad topic that I would say that organ donation would save my life. So when I was born, I was a healthy baby. There was nothing wrong. Just grew up in the ways a little baby should. <laughs> and then my parents noticed my breathing was worsening, and they sent me to Fairfax Hospital in Virginia, and there they diagnosed me with idiopathic cardiomyopathy, and this is me waiting in the hospital with my family and the nurse. Um, since my health was not getting any better from after visiting Fairfax, I was put on the list for heart transplant at age three, and I waited at home for five months for it. So they definitely figured out that idiopathic cardiomyopathy would be something that the only way they'd be able to solve it is by giving me a heart transplant. So after I waited a couple months, and then I got a call from Pittsburgh, Children's Hospital Pittsburgh, and they told me that they could, I could come up to the ICU for eight days to wait for my new heart. And it did come eventually. And this is me and my sister waiting in the hospital, both curly-haired girls. And this is me waiting in the hospital as well. So after eight days waiting in the ICU for very, probably very hard times for my family especially, um, finally, on August 8, 2000, was the day of my surgery, so I finally got my life saving organ. And this is a picture of me um, with all my toys and animals we called Zoo in my room, which meant my family and friends would bring different gifts for me and surround with me to bring me happiness through such a hard time. So after the surgery, it took a while to recover. I had to take many, I just had many follow up biopsies to make sure my body did not reject my heart. I even had a feeding tube for a while because it was hard to recover from such traumatic surgery. So three months recovering in the hospital, waiting to make sure everything was good and the heart was perfect. Um, I was finally able to go home, which is the best part. And this is me eating my first dinner at a restaurant since the hospital, <laughs> which I was very happy about because I love food. And I was like, get me out and let me eat this food. Because <laughs> yeah, it was a great place. And not being able to be stuck in one isolated room for a while was nice. Definitely. <laughs> so now, almost 14 years ago, I'm healthy and happy. This is a picture of me in St. John, where my grandpa has a house that we stay. 
in that winter. Um, so a little bit more of the medicational side, since you guys probably are more knowledgeable about that than I am. But anyway, um, like Dr. Arias was explaining, I do take Prograf and Trachylimus. So that was mentioned already. And I also take Celsep, and these are pictures of the two drugs. Um, I do have different side effects from the surgery, other than just the immune suppressant ones. Um, I do have ADHD and ADHD, so I take Sperterra for that. For anxiety, I take Lexapro, and for stomach digestive, because of side effects a lot of the anti-rejection medicines leave a stomach problem, I guess. I'm not quite sure. So I have to take that in order to let everything work in my body. Um, so also, I get blood tests every two months. And the target level for the blood test is between the five and six. So every time I go, I don't have to go back to the regular hospital. I can get it done here locally or up there, depending on the situation. And that's the level that they would always want to make sure if I need to raise my dose or not. So also, I get um, echocardiograms, EKGs, every four months. And this is a picture of me getting one recently. It's another way to check, um, a very effective way. But the most effective way to check for rejection is definitely a biopsy and catheterization. That's the best way to go through and look exactly and get a microscopic piece of your heart to make sure it's everything's tip-top in shape. So annually, I get a right-sided cardiac catheterization biopsy, which means they go the neck, and then they go get a microscopic piece of my heart, and they look under a microscope for any rejection. And then biannually, as well as getting the neck one, I get a left-sided cardiac catheterization with coronary anagrography, which means they check from the groin and neck as well to see both sides of the heart. And they still take a microscopic piece to check for different levels and things like that. So that has not stopped me there. I've been extremely athletic. This is a picture of me hiking in Yellowstone. This is basically hiking with my family. And people sometimes think that because you got a heart transplant, you're not as active. But the most important way to be heart healthy is to walk and be active and do things that you love and being outdoors. So I use it totally to my advantage and it has never stopped me there. So also, um, hobbies, activities that Dr. Arias explained, like musicals and stuff like that. And um, this is recently, we had a winter musical at my school. We did Oklahoma, and this is a picture of me there, so um, with my friends and everything. And this is um, our a cappella group that we sang at the National Cathedral. My friend Tiffany Snyder here is too, was in the picture as well. <laughs> and um, basically, my heart transplant has not stopped me for things I'm passionate about and activities I love to join at school has never really been in the way for me. So also being able, after hearing about the 2008 transplant games, which are Olympic style games for donor families, living, living donors, and transplant recipients, um, I heard about it. And basically each state from the nation is represented. Um, and they all come together for Olympic style games and are able to connect and do interesting activities together and participate in sports. And it's amazing, inspiring seeing everybody just like me with transplants that can do super athletic things. It's great. So this is me with Team Maryland, so I'm from Maryland, in our crab outfit. We represented the Chesapeake Bay and everything, so go Maryland, I guess. <laughs> with little pom-poms and crab hat and everything, so that's me at the first Transplant Games. So when I was there, I met so many amazing people. This is my team. Almost every single person here is a transplant recipient, which is amazing. I would never have met anybody like that in my lifetime. I'm probably the only person other than the few people I knew outside of from the transplant games that had transplants. So it was amazing to talk to them and see how many people are just like me. Um, when I was there, I talked to a man, and he was part of a donor family. And he was telling me that his, his daughter, when he, his daughter passed away, he was, they decided that they wanted to donate the organs of his daughter. And from there, he wanted to know the recipient of his daughter's organs, what does she like, or he or she like broccoli? Do they like the, was their favorite color pink? And at first, I couldn't really understand why would we want to ask the simple questions? Wouldn't you kind of want to know the entire big picture of the story? Wouldn't you want to know how she's doing, or where she's in school, or she might go to college eventually? Wouldn't you want to know that? And I realized just the small little attributes in life, being able to know just a few things that make the person happy or part of them, that's the individual, was the most important part. So from there, when I got home, I decided to write to my donor family. And usually, you write care of the hospital. So you can't have a direct con contact with them unless you both of you agree to have it, and you write back to each other. So this time, just for me, I wrote to them. Usually my parents and I would send holiday cards every year to show them how I was doing, but I never heard back from them. I don't know if they received it, but anyways, we're supposed to go through the hospital. So I decided I was going to tell them about the transplant games, how I was so inspired there. I met so many amazing people that I decided to write for them, for me, this time. 
So um, I, this time when I sent the letter in the mail, I got a lucky response, and I did get a message from them myself. And when the envelope came from Athens, Georgia, I didn't really know anybody there, so I was like, who is this person? And I opened the card, and I realized that my donor family was ready to meet me after 10 years. They had their contact information. They had a picture of my donor. And it was just amazing. And from there, the relationship has blossomed into something amazing that I can't even describe. So anyway, we decided that the transplant games happened biannually. So we decided, let's try to coordinate to meet each other, because we were both ready. So um, through my team, um, team Maryland manager, we worked out a time to meet at the Transplant Games, which is probably the best place to meet because it's not an awkward place and it's surrounded by people just like you. We decided to meet, and this is on the right. It's the first time I met them. This is my family and the mom, Carolyn, and the son, Ben. So I got to meet them. And we're in our Team Maryland outfits and everything like that. So we got to spend a week there. It was in Pittsburgh, no, sorry, Madison, Wisconsin. We got to experiment different fun things and watch games together. So it was definitely an amazing experience to meet them. Something I will never forget, definitely. So our relationship has never stopped from there. I got to visit my donor family for the second time. They live in Athens, Georgia. So we were able to fly in for Ben, who's the middle child who I met originally, whose graduation they invited us for his graduation. And then I got to meet um, the rest of their extended family as well. And my family is there too. We spent a week with them. And it was just amazing and great to know everybody there that they wanted not just to meet me the first time at the transplant games, but wanted to to do relationship together. So also from there, because I'm so inspired about what, how lucky I am, I've been an advocate for organ donation. I'm a Maryland, let's see, Motor Vehicle Association, that's the word, yes, Motor, Motor Vehicle Association Ambassador. So when you go to renew your driver's license or whatever identification card, um, usually it's the number one place they ask if you want to be an organ donor, usually you get a symbol on your, like a heart or a circle on your driver's license to indicate you're an organ donor. So I thought the best place to reach out was the DMV because they are, that's the place that the number one organ donor rate comes to as possible because there's so much outreach you can do, but when people are there and signing up to be, um, signing up to renew their license and stuff, they're able to put if they want to be an organ donor or not, it's the most effective way to get as many, many organ donors as possible. Also, I work at health fairs in the area, basically different places, um, have booths with Donate Life stuff and things to explain. So that's also really fun. And also, this is a picture of me testifying at the Maryland State Senate. And I was there to uh, advocate for a passable law in Maryland called the opt-out system. Right now, we have the opt-in system, which means that when you go to the DMV or MVA, you say yes or no if you want to be an organ donor. But with this um, legislation, if it would have passed, unfortunately it did not, um, you would have been, you automatically be registered as an organ donor. So those who are not familiar with organ donation or don't have one opinion over another, automatically be an organ donor that way. And this is also a picture of me. I was in the Washingtonian, which is a local magazine. This is a picture of me as I wrote an article about meeting my donor Philly for this first time. Yeah, thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, up this time. How do you deal with, with um, the problem in life of actually needing an immune system when you get sick to fight off your infection if you have to suppress your immune system all the time? Right, that's a great question. Um, the que but basically, I know because of my immune system and the way that my medicines work, I do get sick more easily than others. So I'm careful about that. I take more vitamins. I make sure I eat healthy food and stuff like that. And yes, it's much easier for me to get an infection or a disease that way, but I'm very careful about it, and I try to be safe from people as much as I can that are sick with their possible surroundings. Just take medications like a regular person, I guess. <laughs> as much as whatever medications I'm allowed to take, I would take in order to fix it. There's definitely a way to solve it. Thank you. Are there any other questions? You sure? Will there be an oh, opportunity yes, later? Yeah, here. Um, I was surprised what? at 
how rigorously you're still surveilled for rejection. Right. Does your risk for rejection go down over time? Will it eventually be very, very small? I don't or is it think so. Constant? I think it's just a matter, I'm very lucky to have such a great heart that I have. And I do, when I get biopsies and catheterizations, I do check for rejection. But so far, I've been great. And don't want to jinx that. But so far, I've been doing great. And I don't think it's a matter of over time. I think maybe if your body gets more used to your organ, maybe that could help. I don't know exactly the scientific version of that. But I think it's just a matter of being able to stay healthy and taking care of taking your medicines every day and taking care of yourself. Uh, Allie, what does huh? the Washington transplant community that you're part of, right. what, what, what's their, what do they do? What, what's their goal? Uh -huh. Oh, I can just talk here. You. Okay. <laughs> um, they're a nonprofit organization to spread organ donation in the uh, uh, Maryland and Virginia areas, different counties, and we're just, we go to different health fairs, and we, um, the Cherry Blossom Festival that Dr. Arias mentioned, we, I was part of that too. We just do different outreach programs to reach people, to get, get consider people to be organ donors. So when you say that you've spoken at schools, huh? uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I have spoken at my middle school and also my high school, and I basically share my story. And there, I think, especially in high school, and I shared it because high schoolers are the people who are thinking about getting their license, getting their permit. So I think they're the most important people to out to reach because they're about to go to license their get their permit or license, and they have the big choice right in a second to say. Yes, I want to be organ donor or no, that can potentially save so many people's lives. And I basically just share my story. I make it very simple. I don't get, I, this is more of the talk that I gave today was more of a medical side of it. I just kind of simplify and kind of explain everything word for word that people are not quite aware of as much. So that's a little bit different depending on the audiences. I just changed my speeches based on that. Well, exciting way you made the presentation. Thank you. Question I have is: Are you following the growth curve of your heart? Am I following the what? The growth rate of your heart. Oh, the so growth rate. Yeah. Um, I don't don't know how to follow the growth rate of my heart. Okay. To be perfectly <laughs> honest. Your cardiologist might be doing it. Huh? Your cardiologist. Or cardiac yes. Mm -hmm. The cardiologist monitor the growth of my heart. Yes, correct. Thank you. Did, when you had your transplant, did you get your, um, did you retain your original pacemaker or did you get the tr a new pacemaker from the new heart? I think I never had a pacemaker, if that's correct. Yes, that, I've never had a pacemaker, luckily. Yes, I've been lucky, fortunate enough not to ever have a pacemaker, which is great. So I, ah, this is Allie's mother. Well, hi, everybody. I, I think that I'm probably not the perfect person to answer, and Allie doesn't always know all the details of things that, you know, she doesn't really want to know. We don't make her learn about them. So I think I'm going to pass this, if it's okay with you, Dr. Arias, to my husband, Eric LaRue, who's a doctor, and he could answer some of your questions that were a little more technical, so that's okay. <laughs> yes. Well, actually, Dr. Odom could, but you could talk about Allie specifically. No, it's okay. Okay, I will. Just to tell you that the Washington Regional Transplant Community also goes to the hospitals and tries to talk to families about the decision of giving, uh, they're uh, making the decision to be a donor at that time. They work in tandem with all the hospitals locally, and Allie's gone to some of them and talked to different nurses and doctors to give them right. um, motivation and inspiration that this really is a great thing for people, and it does affect people's lives in an incredibly powerful and important way. And so she does that, and that's part of their job as well. And then the other question you had is, does her heart grow? And I'm pretty sure Dr. Odom can address that better than I can, but um, I'm sure it has been growing all right. along. Right. I, I think your heart is the size of your fist. I think you just, is that the right? The heart does grow and accommodate the body. In fact, your heart probably was denovated. There was no innovation to mm -hmm. it because it had to be cut out of somebody right. and implanted in you. And those nerves over time grow back into the graft. So the heart does grow mm -hmm. along with you. Yeah. And that's the remarkable thing about uh, physiologic accommodation. Growth issues do impact young kids who have transplants because of the medications they're on, like steroids. And that's one of the issues that many pediatricians uh, will follow in terms of does do children achieve their optimal uh, growth. Uh, they also look at mm -hmm. development right. and those types of things. But in terms of the heart, 
uh, if we went back in the chest, it would be uh, a nice big <laughs> heart right. appropriate for her size. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Ellie, do people treat you any differently because you tell them about your story? Um, no, I have not been treated differently, thank goodness, which is great. I mean, I do, when I say I do have a transplant to people who are unfamiliar, um, I do get, like, can you exercise enough? Can you do this? Can you do that? And yes, I can. I prove that you can do pretty much anything with a heart transplant. I mean, I haven't really never been treated that harshly about it, but I just feel like people sometimes have a lot of questions when I tell them about it, and I are open to answer. They usually just ask, like, what age you were and stuff like that. But no, no, usually they don't treat me differently, which is great. Thank you. You said in the state of Maryland we're still at an opt-in for uh, huh? being a donor. Could you say a little bit more of was that the first time was brought up? Or was it close to passing? And how do we go about getting it to actually be an right. opt-out state? Thank you. I agree totally. Um, I think I think that was the first time we brought to legislation. I'm not quite sure. I I was invited to do that. Um, the problem was that when I was there, I did I like the opt-in system, but different organizations. I'm just not going to say their name because I don't want to embarrass them. But some organizations that from an organization that I work with or in the area do not agree with the, um, with the opt-out system because they feel like if people are forced to do things they don't like, which people sometimes have objection to the government making them do certain things that they don't want to be part of, they think that people are going to be less likely to um, donate their organs, which I disagree on. But um, because there were so many powerful organizations there that had a very strong opinion about the opt-in system, Unfortunately, it did not go to the next step. Thank okay, you. Okay, well, there will be an opportunity to ask questions later. Allie, we want to thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. All right, Jonah, the podium is yours. Thank you, Wynn, for your kind introduction. And better yet, thank you, Ali, for uh, really setting uh, the stage here. Uh, your story uh, was truly uh, inspirational. Uh, you clearly demonstrate uh, character, compassion, and real courage. And it's because of people like you that we're in this business. Uh, tremendous. We may have uh, some things in common that you're not aware of. Uh, my uh, family is uh, from Pittsburgh, it's where we've been situated for four decades now, uh, when we came from West Africa because of the war. Furthermore, uh, some people say that I was swallowed by a whale. But my familial name uh, at home is Joey just to let you <coughs> know. OK, this uh, chart sort of gives you an overview of the transplant experience uh, in the United States. It's uh, an old slide, but it's pretty uh, well germane. What you can see is that pediatric transplants account for about 2 to 3 percent of all transplants. Furthermore, you can see that intestinal transplants, uh, the bulk of them are in kids, as opposed to the other solid organs. And I think the only uh, important difference uh, with what's going on today is that lung transplants uh, have now uh, or are about to eclipse the number of heart transplants being done. It's sort of neck and neck in the 2,000 range. I might, I want to add to Wynn's slide, since you guys are taking an exam, in 1963, that was the first liver transplant, which was done by uh, Tom Stossel in Colorado, and the first lung transplant was done by Joel Cooper in Toronto in 1983. 
uh, for those of you who have to take exams. Um, you talked about uh, multivisceral transplantation. They're about the only item that's not, that's new, that's not on that list, uh, following what's going on in the Middle East, is the rise of uh, what we call vascular composite allografts, that is transplantation of the face and limbs, which has now come under the purview of the United Network Organ Sharing and the OPTN. So that group of transplantations will now be overseen by the same organization that oversees all the rest of the solid transplants. And they're just organizing themselves in terms of following the statistics. Now, the last 60 years has demonstrated and witnessed tremendous success in transplantation. In fact, for all these solid organs, uh, the graft in patient survival is uh, 90%. Some of the organs that are a little behind, like uh, intestine, for example, and lung, are rapidly gaining. Again, they're moving up uh, the learning curve. There were grafts that uh, we began to implant uh, within the last 20 and 30 years, as opposed to 50 and 60 years uh, with the kidney. But we still have quite a bit to do, uh, because despite the tremendous success we've had early on, uh, there is still issues with uh, long-term performance and graft loss uh, for all the organs. Another way of representing that is by this picture, which uh, essentially demonstrates that, uh, and this is for pediatric hearts, although this curve is essentially, you can superimpose any organ on this curve in terms of uh, the kinetics of the curve. Most of the mortality is early on in the first year, where you have the big drop, and then it levels with a gradual, insidious uh, loss of graph with time. And what has happened over 50, 60 years is that the curve, which started down here, has been shifted up with all our technologies. Uh, but it's it, essentially the same. So. Basically, we've, got, we've gotten very, very good with the early uh, issues after transplantation. But there is a biological constraint, which seems to be what happens uh, long term. Another thing that you might uh, notice here is that the children tend to do much better when they get transplanted, i.e., they have much uh, better long term uh, uh, holding on to the graph as opposed to uh, adults. And this green curve represents adolescents, which, is, uh, which do the worst for all solid organs. And clearly there's a lot of things going on with adolescents, uh, physiology, hormones. And what is emerging is the concept of compliance with medical management and non-adherence, uh, not taking uh, medications. So there are many people now trying to address that component to push this part of the curve up. Uh, and some of the things that are being used are uh, transplant coaches, parents and kids have a little uh, a device where they get a, a beep and a reminder <laughs> uh, to take uh, the drugs. Many people are beginning to investigate that in a lot of teams. You guys can ask questions. I don't. This doesn't have to be <laughs> formal. If you have any questions, uh, pipe in. Now, there are a number of pestering problems, and Ali very clearly uh, alluded to uh, one of the pressing ones, which is the issue of the supply-demand imbalance, which is why it's very important that she's doing what she's doing, because that's about the only way we've been able to get organs. And even on top of what OPOs have to do, because by law, when there's somebody who's dead in a hospital or dying, uh, or maybe a potential donor, the hospital in any uh, in the United States has to report that to their local OPO that serves them. And OPO is an organ procurement uh, 
agency or enterprise. There are about 50 of them, and they cover uh, the land and have a catchment area that's called a, a donor service uh, network. So the OPO uh, then goes to the hospital to evaluate the potential donor, uh, discuss things with the uh, family. Very important that the person who's doing that is not actually the transplant team. It's uh, someone who's an arm's length uh, from the process. Now, with regards to uh, the opt-in and opt-out, some systems around the globe have been very, very effective with positive consent rates for donations, particularly Spain in Europe, which has a uh, opt-out uh, system. So automatically, uh, you're an organ donor until you say you don't want to be an organ donor. Uh, in the US, uh, the average consent rate is about 50%, uh, or a little shy of 50%. So despite the best efforts over the last two de decades, which have included uh, a lot of collabor, uh, a, a lot of organ, uh, a lot of um, marketing by the OPOs, and there have been three or four of these sort of big efforts nationally to uh, get donors uh, to sign their cards and to improve the, the, the number of organs you can get from an individual, which is potentially about eight, and you count it all up, including tissues, you know, cartilage, segments of vein, uh, a bone, an artery, that are used uh, for reconstructive purposes in people with uh, deficits. There is also the problem, and Ali talked about some of the issues with the drugs that she has to take in terms of the uh, morbidity. And uh, many a times, it's those issues that remain. And we have patients and, and individuals who have functioning grafts, but they're developing issues with cardiovascular disease, renal disease, because of the uh, types of uh, medications they're taking and the side effects. Then there's the issue of uh, chronic rejection, which uh, is really a smoldering, ongoing injury that we're now beginning to appreciate. And this injury is both immune-mediated, and it looks like it's non-immune-mediated, related to things like ischemia reperfusion, what happened in the donor even before it got into the host or the recipient. And so there's a lot of effort now trying to target donor management, because all our effort over the last uh, four or five decades has been on recipient management. And then there are a lot of emerging uh, therapeutics uh, that are coming on, uh, particularly mechanical circulatory assistance, uh, ALVADs, uh, and uh, xenotransplants, uh, stem cells, and whole organ engineering. Some of the latter uh, technologies are not ready for prime time, but uh, mechanical circulatory assistance is. And over the last uh, three or four years, there's been uh, almost a five-time increase in the number of these uh, smaller devices that are now placed in patients. Uh, the smaller devices are easier to handle, and patients are doing much better with them. There are a lot of uh, knowledge gaps uh, that uh, the field is trying to uh, Bill, uh, we're looking with the advent of genomics and uh, uh, proteomics, um, the opportunity for personalized uh, therapy and personalized immunosuppression uh, is really on the horizon. Uh, and we're just beginning to try and understand what all that means. There is the need to continue to improve increase the number of donors, but more importantly, to begin to focus on managing the donor, repairing the donor, resuscitating the donor, re refurbishing it, optimizing its condition, attacking those non-immune elements that we now know play a role in the ongoing injury. Uh, it's almost like les jeux sont faits uh, when you, the, heart, the heart or organ is is harvested. So there is an opportunity 
that the field is just beginning to grapple with to begin to address the donor, to hopefully improve that uh, curve, the slope. And then one of the issues that is uh, really beginning to revolutionize the field is the impact of B cells and antibodies. We're spent so much of our attention on the T cell. Uh, and Wynne talked about uh, Medawar and how uh, rejection uh, was an immunological phenomenon. But in those days, it was a T cell based immunological phenomenon. Uh, and when we looked at the organs, uh, we saw T cells uh, in the tissue causing the damage. Uh, we didn't have all the technologies to uh, look at the products of B cells, like antibodies. Uh, we didn't have uh, the uh, immunofluorescence and, and the staining to look at complement and debris, the, the, the leftovers after antibody-mediated uh, injury. And over the last uh, four, five, six years, with technologies now to be able to identify antibodies uh, in patients uh, and antigens at the molecular level, uh, it's clear that these uh, antibodies play a role. Because when you look retrospectively at outcomes in kidney, lung, heart, uh, they seem to do better when there's no donor-specific antibody uh, that you put in or arises de novo in the recipient. So there's a lot of effort now um, being put to try to come up with ways to target this and perhaps improve uh, the uh, long-term outcome. Now let's step back a bit, because some people are due some credit. Uh, Alex Corral, at the turn of the last century, uh, really developed the techniques for sewing vessels together. And without uh, his seamstress uh, ability back in 1912, uh, no one would be doing transplantation. And he worked this out in a xenotransplant model, you know, sewing uh, kidneys in the neck of dogs. Uh, he got a Nobel Prize uh, for this work. And this is uh, the hooking of uh, tubes, vessels, has been fundamental to surgery for the last uh, century. Now, before one could actually tackle the heart, that nobody really could operate on the heart. I mean, it's full of blood and it's jumping up and beating. You, you can't accurately fix it. And Bigelow uh, came up with the concept of hypothermia, the Q10 principle, by reducing the temperature uh, of the organ 10 degrees. Uh, for every 10 degrees Celsius you reduce the temperature, the cellular metabolism is cut by 50%. And so, he was able to then begin to work on the human heart back in the mid-40s and early 50s using this technique of hypothermia. And they simply just arrested the circulation, stopped it, <laughs> and then <laughs> worked real fast to uh, uh, try and fix the heart. The problem with that is that you, you, could only do, you only had about half an hour <laughs> of time uh, to do this. But uh, many successful uh, operations uh, on the heart uh, occurred this way in the middle of the last century. Now, um, folk needed a little bit more time uh, to work with the heart. And somebody had to uh, develop a system of bypassing the heart, emptying it, but allowing red blood to perfuse the rest of the body and returning uh, blue blood to some sort of an oxygenator. And in Minnesota, Walt Lillehei, in the late 40s and 50s, decided to make uh, the loved one the biological heart-lung machine. And so basically he was able, and that was very brave, but in the day he was able to do uh, 40, 50, 60 cases, tetralogy of Phalloropes, VSDs, simply by uh, matching a uh, biological cardiopulmonary bypass system, which was a relative with compatible blood type with uh, the uh, recipient who needed the repair. Of course, uh, this is what the OR looked like 
two adjoining tables. Uh, and of course, this is one of the few cases where the mortality rate uh, could be 200% instead of 100%. But uh, conceptually, uh, this is where it was going. Clearly, that didn't last too long. <laughs> and uh, Gibbons developed a mechanical system of doing this without having to use another human being as the uh, oxygenator and the pump. And as you can see, this is a huge thing that takes up half the operating room. But now, uh, with digitalization, is a very, very small unit. So these things, uh, the anastomosis, concepts of, hy of hypothermia, cardiopulmonary bypass, to protect the heart and be safe, uh, allowed uh, cardiac transplantation uh, to begin. And of course, uh, Christian Bernard is credited with the first uh, heart transplant in humans. And this was in December in 1967. Interestingly enough, uh, 10 years or 15 years before, he had been in the US as a uh, fellow with Walt Lillehei of the cross circulation <laughs> fame, along with Norman Shumway, who was a fellow from Stanford, all working in uh, Lillehei's lab. And they were, at that time, developing transplantation techniques uh, in animals. And clearly, Christian uh, learned uh, the technique well, went back to uh, South Africa, and was the first uh, uh, man to uh, uh, do a human uh, heart transplant. Uh, story has it that uh, Shumway never spoke to him. <laughs> After that, Shumway did go on to uh, do the first uh, heart transplantation in humans uh, in uh, 1968. And as you can see, uh, this, is, this is the donor. Uh, she was a young uh, gal who was crossing the street and was hit by a car. And she had severe brain injury. Uh, the uh, recipient, this gentleman here, was about a 50-ish year old uh, um, a laborer who uh, had end-stage heart failure. And he consented uh, with uh, Bernard uh, to, uh, for a human heart. And because this woman was in such uh, duress, brain completely gone, but not brain dead, uh, after he got the consent, uh, she, be, she is known as the first donation after cardiac death. So uh, Bernard actually hastened uh, cardiac death with potassium and uh, uh, transplanted uh, that heart into uh, this gentleman uh, who uh, lived for about 18 days and, and died of uh, pneumonia. But uh, uh, he uh, received a lot of notoriety for this, and a lot of units opened up all over the world. But uh, unfortunately, the transplants that were done for the next uh, 10 years all died. The results were uh, very abysmal. And so there was a moratorium on heart transplantation until uh, cyclosporin came back uh, and was introduced in the, late, in the early 80s. And then heart transplantation really uh, took off again. This is a schema. Uh, This is the, uh, the, the cable veins, big veins sewn in, the uh, aorta and the pulmonary artery. This is the uh, circuit, cardiopulmonary bypass, with the snares at the entrance of both cava so the heart can be emptied and one can work. This is the donor heart. And, uh, this is the right atrium. It's kind of opened up. And these are the four pulmonary veins going into the left atrium. And the heart is essentially connected to the recipient atrium. And this is called the Shumway biatrial technique. This is the technique that was used predominantly for many, many decades. Uh, what's interesting is that there are two P waves on the electrocardiogram. And so if 
uh, and many cardiologists used to trick their fellows <laughs> on the oral exams, looking at electrocardiograms, uh, and trying to get them to interpret a electrocardiogram from someone who's had a atrial, biatrial technique. And what you see are the P waves from the base recipient, which is at the junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium, and then the P wave from the donor heart. So this technique has fallen out of favor because many a times one, there's a discrepancy in the size. And when you sort of put things together, the orientation of the internal valves isn't absolutely perfect. So many of these patients uh, had what we call right and left sided uh, leakiness of the valves just because it didn't sit right. And so they switch to what is called a bicaval technique, where the uh, internal aspect of the heart is really left alone. And we just attach the large caval veins. And that has done a lot to reduce issues with arrhythmias, uh, particularly atrial arrhythmias, and the use of pacemakers and so forth uh, in these patients. Unlike uh, the heart that uh, Will passed around, uh, this is a different type of heart. And uh, this patient had a heterotaxy uh, syndrome in that the liver uh, was on the opposite side of the body. Everything was switched. Uh, the inferior vena cava was interrupted and did not come on the right side, but uh, came to join the azagous vein through the diaphragm. And of course, when you go out to do a transplant in someone with this sort of congenital abnormality, there's a lot of plumbing. You have to borrow, hopefully, tissue from the donor. So you take uh, superior vena cava and a nominate vein so you can actually create a neo superior vena cava here. So all this is donor vein that uh, came with the heart to reconstruct uh, a normal oriented heart. And then there's uh, extra plumbing here. This is a Gore-Tex tube that's rimmed such that it doesn't collapse with the weight of the heart. So uh, the typical congenital heart case uh, many a times requires a lot of uh, creativity in uh, trying to get it right. And Ali talked about the biopsies that she had early on for the first uh, couple of years, which is fairly routine. And the guy who uh, developed that technique, uh, Caves, in 1975 uh, at Stanford, where a biotome is placed through the internal jugular vein, which just runs straight down through the right heart. And you can take pieces. They usually take about three to five pieces of uh, muscle. Uh, in the interventricular septum or partition between the right pump and the left pump. Uh, and uh, this has worked nicely. This is really the gold standard for trying to diagnose uh, rejection. But of course, if we could come up with earlier markers uh, to do this, biomarkers, uh, uh, subjects can avoid the nuisance of always having their internal jugular stuck for, or sometimes you have to go from below or cross from the opposite side. Many programs now don't, after two, three, four years, don't routinely do this, only if the patient has signs and symptoms, and what they use are other techniques, echo, other imaging techniques that are non-invasive to look for shortening fraction, how well the heart is squeezing, how thick it is. If there's a process going on in the, in the muscle, then there's edema. And measuring those things sometimes gives uh, a clue as to what uh, might be going on in the context of uh, signs and symptoms. Now, so transplantation, while is a lifesaver, introduces some pathology, as Ali has described. You know, all the effects of the drugs that people have to take. Uh, and of course, somebody talked about, well, if you're immunosuppressed 
And these are not sort of personalized drugs. They're not targeted drugs. It's almost like a gunshot uh, to the immune system. You also affect the immune system ability to survey for uh, mitosis and cancers and infection. And so uh, some of the patients are also clearly at risk for infection and, and these things. And when patients get infected uh, and it's not rejection, uh, we reduce the immunosuppression and add anti-infective uh, drugs to uh, tackle the infection, whether it be uh, virus uh, or bacteria. Of course, there's allograft rejection, and we've made tremendous, I mean, right now, the incidence of acute rejection is less than 10% in hearts. Uh, when I was doing them, it was 30 to 40%. Uh, so in even a short period of, in the first year, a short period of time, uh, we've really made tremendous gains with understanding uh, T cell biology uh, and uh, how to block its activation using combinations of drugs rather than one to block it at different uh, upstream and downstream pathways. Uh, in a, uh, so we end up using less uh, and exposing uh, a subject to uh, uh, less uh, toxicity. Then there's uh, humoral antibody-mediated rejection, which uh, is becoming uh, of more interest to the transplantation field now that we're able to, we have much uh, more sensitive uh, assays uh, to measure these antibodies and uh, to measure their function. Now, in general, uh, today uh, for hearts, uh, the drug management uh, can be classified rather simply into three categories. Uh, one is called induction, that is around the transplant, the peritransplant or implantation phase. And because acute rejection usually occurs, the risky period is early, first three or six months, the goal here is to try and wipe out the bad players, uh, the effector cells, the T cells. And so uh, many centers will use uh, antibodies to T cells. Uh, to completely wipe out uh, T cells and then bring on other agents during this uh, uh, period of time. The next phase is maintenance, which is the chronic therapy, uh, and it's usually triple drug with steroids, uh, calcineuring inhibitors, uh, like a Ali talked about uh, the cyclosporin and uh, tacrolimus, and then usually an antiproliferative agent. Uh, MF, MMF or azeotheoprin, which uh, is not being used as much. And now there's another thing that's sort of come in, which is called desensitization. That is patients who have antibodies, uh, and they have donor-specific antibodies. That is antibodies to the donor heart or the donor allograft, either before, while on the waiting list, uh, because these are prime players, there's a host of ways that many groups do go about to either get rid of these things or reduce them. Uh, and the fact that there are so many ways of doing it suggests that it's, we don't have <laughs> the correct answer. And many of these studies uh, can't be done in a strictly scientific uh, fashion using a randomized controlled trial because you're dealing with really a rare disease, only 2,000 heart transplants. And unless uh, groups work in networks and standardize the phenotype and so forth, it's hard to, to, to get a real evidence-based type of clinical trial going to see what is better. Uh, but at any rate, uh, some of the things that are used are to basically screen the blood, get rid of uh, the antibodies, to uh, bombard the B cell with rituximab or bombard the... Uh, B cell factory that makes the antibodies, the uh, uh, plasma cells. And so there are a number of agents that are used uh, both singly and in combination uh, by different uh, sites. And at the end of the day, um, it's uh, a little more of an art form uh, than it is uh, a true science. Uh, this is just a list of some of the immunosuppressive agents the uh, newest agent on the block, 
that was just FDA approved a couple of years back is a co-stimulatory blockade agent uh, to this T cell, which is called uh, Balatacep. Uh, and this is the uh, only introduction that's been FDA approved uh, for the last uh, 15 years or so. And this drug does not, as a co-stimulatory blocker, does not have the same effect as the calcineurin inhibitor. And so the registration trials uh, documented uh, better renal profile uh, in those patients with Velatasap. Unfortunately, the patients had uh, a much higher incidence of uh, rejection. Although the rejection episodes were easily controlled, uh, but it's always a concern because rejection uh, begets uh, healing, which then begets scar and fibrosis. So right now it's in sort of post-market uh, uh, investigation. And perhaps we don't quite know how to use the drug uh, yet. We may, I think, be uh, tapering off the calcineurin too early in the first year, which is why we're seeing rejection. And perhaps maybe uh, subjects should stay on the calcineurin a little longer before getting off it and weaning to Bellatessa to uh, protect the kidneys. But that remains to be uh, studied. The side effects of the immunosuppressive agents are uh, legion from cosmetic issues uh, to metabolic issues, which is significant, uh, diabetes, hypertension, uh, infectious issues we've talked about, and uh, uh, many, uh, some folk develop uh, skin uh, uh, malignancies. And of course, the, the big one, uh, the renal toxicities uh, with uh, the calcineurin and uh, tacrolimus, which is really the workhorse uh, immunosuppressive agent for all organs. So immunotherapy is really a balance. Even though we measure levels, it's unclear what is a particular subject's immune activation state because it's different. You can have a level for um, an African-American would be uh, the same as someone else, but the African-American needs more drug, it, looks, it, it, it turns out, because of uh, how the drug is handled by the liver. And so uh, there's a lot of personalization that needs to come into the field because just measuring levels doesn't tell the true story. Uh, and so uh, there's an active search for uh, uh, using genomics and pharmacodynamic and kinetic uh, things to arrive at this. Now, this uh, slide just documents uh, the, uh, what, what is happening with the use of mechanical circulatory assist devices. Uh, more and more of these devices are being placed in kids with, uh, who have end-stage heart failure. And what this really depicts is the number that get ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane circulation, uh, which is sort of the only thing we've had for 20 or 30 years because you can put it in small babies. Uh, a lot of the other things like VADs and total artificial hearts are big uh, uh, devices and hard to put into a five kilogram chest. But uh, new pumps are emerging. They're getting smaller, particularly the Berlin heart uh, with pump volumes as low as 10 cc's. Uh, all gradated all the way up to 50 cc's. So more of these are now getting put in uh, to children. And uh, when you look at the results, when you bridge a child with one of these pumps while the child is waiting for a heart transplant, they do much better than if they get bridged with ECMO significantly. And that's the curve that uh, tells that picture. These are the children that get bridged with ECMO versus those with an LVAD. Now, the 
whole issue of chronic rejection and uh, injury is summed up by what we call coronary artery vasculopathy. And this uh, uh, curves basically show, based on ages, uh, which group at the time of transplant, which group tends uh, to develop it quicker. And as you can see in the green curve, the kids that get transplanted as adolescents versus those that are younger tend to uh, develop this process uh, faster. And I think we think that compliance and non-adherence plays a significant role uh, into this, besides the physiology of ad adolescence. These are the uh, risk factors for one-year mortality after heart transplant. And not, surpri not surprising, ECMO has a hazard ratio of you know, under three. A retransplant uh, carries uh, significant mortality uh, after uh, at one year. Someone with congenital heart diagnosis, that is, they've had probably multiple operations and have structural abnormalities uh, in their native pumps, and uh, those that have uh, renal failure on dialysis. We've talked a little bit about uh, rejection. Again, the key thing is chronic uh, rejection. Uh, which is the uh, scarring and fibrosis. This is just a quick example of a, uh, a, a young girl, uh, long, young woman who had four or five children and had a heart transplant just about 15 years ago and suffered um, antibody-mediated rejection. And the top picture is a transection through the two pumps and you can see basically the hemorrhage from antibody-mediated rejection and sluggish uh, blood flow and thrombosis. And under uh, the microscope, the infiltration of uh, the uh, muscle fibers and uh, with immunofluorescence, the staining of the antibodies and complement, uh, crystallizing the diagnosis. Uh, heart transplantation, because you needed to put the heart in quickly, you had about four or five hours. You, we didn't have time to get cross matches back in those days. Uh, and if this woman had had a cross match, we would have known that there were antibodies to that donor heart. This is uh, some more of the same, and I'll just move on. This is some of the immunopathology stains to pick up a uh, complement and fragments. This is. Uh, the uh, heart cath that folk get to look for coronary vasculopathy. Here, the right coronary artery. You can see this is open. However, when you do an ultrasound in the coronary artery, you can begin to see the endomal thickness. So, because dye gets through the lumen, it doesn't really show you the disease. And this is what it looks like. This is the animal thickness of the smooth muscle hypertrophy encroaching uh, on the lumen. We've talked a little bit about the therapies for antibody-mediated rejection. You, you need to fight. You need to know the enemy before you can fight it. Uh, we think it's antibodies and complements. And, uh, uh, almost, uh, in some centers, the kitchen sink is thrown at all these uh, particular uh, culprits to try and uh, salvage. Now, moving on very quickly to uh, other therapies. This is the total artificial heart, or the Abia core, which was placed in the 90s, uh, placed in about six patients. Uh, who uh, were early successes, but there are still a lot of biological constraints with this technology. Too much hardware, incompatible with blood. All these patients had clots at some point in the devices, and they all have to be anticoagulated. And so we've shifted 
to smaller pumps, LVADs. A uh, patient has to have some functioning heart uh, and then using the LVADs. And that's been uh, tremendous. And as you can see, over the last two or three years, the number of implants is just soaring. There are two devices that have been approved by the FDA over the last uh, six or seven years. And uh, in fact, in the adult side, if you don't have one of these in, it's hard to actually even get a transplant because there are too many people on the waiting list with these pumps So, and at status one. So most of the people getting adult heart transplants uh, are being bridged uh, with this device. The, the tremendous benefits, uh, it allows the patient to resuscitate his organs with normal cardiac output. So a patient with a pump uh, can improve their muscle mass, their renal function, uh, their end organ functions, and in fact, they become much better transplant candidates. So if you put the pump in, you don't sort of, the heart comes up, you don't kind of rush off to transplant them. If they're doing well with the pump, let them uh, resuscitate systemically before transplanting them. And now this is the size. You can put them in your hand, some of these continuous flow pumps, uh, which has made it very easy to put in. Uh, and they're not huge uh, devices. Uh, you don't have to go in the pump many times. You can put it through the chest. This is the apex of the uh, left ventricle with the device. This is an intracavity pump. Some of them are outside the rotary device. This is what it looks like uh, in schema. Uh, then there's this story of uh, xenotransplantation. And of course, uh, I'm sure most of you remember uh, his baby Faye back in 1984 in Loma Linda, who had a baboon heart uh, placed uh, in her because she was born without a left side of the circulation. She had hypoplastic left heart syndrome, no left ventricle, no uh, left side uh, uh, conduit. She uh, survived uh, very, uh, for a short period of time, died uh, from antibody-mediated uh, rejection uh, within a couple of weeks. This created a, uh, a big stir because uh, the child, we, we had bypassed human <laughs> uh, heart transplant in a baby in favor of a baboon. Uh, and the following year, the same surgeon was able to do the first uh, successful human-to-human uh, -human baby heart transplantation, opening up the field of pediatric uh, heart transplantation. And of course, uh, the pig now has uh, become the model for the uh, xenotransplant, as opposed to the baboon. Uh, you can raise them uh, in multiple sizes, and now with uh, the uh, uh, if you remember Dolly, uh, and that technology, well, that company has been bought a couple of times, uh, uh, Revivicor, and it's now uh, basically uh, uh, making uh, pig knockouts with humanized uh, human elements uh, for coagulation, inflammation, and galactose. And the general consensus is that rather than the success of xenotransplantation, will probably be better if we can have a good background of genetic modification rather than a whole ton of blood, uh, drugs hitting every single uh, axis. And so over the last two or three years, there's been a tremendous activity, the Japanese group, uh, in developing these pigs with uh, humanized genes, sometimes three, four, five, six of them, and the animal studies are looking more and more uh, promising. Uh, in our own backyard is a company, United Therapeutics, in Silver Springs. And that is their end game, i.e. to put a pig lung in a human by the end of the decade. And uh, they have products for pulmonary hypertension, but uh, Clearly, when those products fail, the end game is, is uh, a lung transplant. Talked about this. 
Now, this uh, goes back to the donor issues and the shortages, repairing the donor heart. So you can take good hearts that function well, but there's some disease. And what we do with them is those that have double vessel disease, good outputs, uh, on the back table, we do a bypass. We jump the blockages and then put the heart in. So, or if there's a leaky valve, aortic or mitral, we, if everything else is pristine, to uh, improve the donor supply, uh, one can do a, a, a valvuloplasty and then implant the heart, or implant the heart and go to the cath lab and use a in, uh, minimally invasive technique to address the coronary artery disease. Furthermore, with donors now, we're pumping the hearts and the lungs. Uh, rather than discarding organs, if an organ doesn't look quite right or happy, but we think that with resuscitation, we can get it better. Uh, we are now uh, under normal thermia, hooking that back up to a circuit using the donor's own blood with a hematocrit of about uh, 20 and uh, analyzing and assessing the heart for a period of 20, 24 hours, lungs. And that's being done in Toronto. And uh, there are a number of trials uh, around the world in which that device is being used to uh, resuscitate and, modu and modulate the heart. Uh, we're using marginal donors. For example, last year, Obama signed the HOPE Act such that we could potentially increase the donor pool uh, to help folk with HIV uh, uh, positive infection, such that under a research uh, program, HIV positive donors uh, are no longer a felon, that the system can take those organs and put them in recipients that are HIV positive. Because HIV disease now is almost like chronic disease. They're living just as long as you and I uh, on antiretroviral uh, therapy. Uh, and it's similar to the model of using hepatitis C positive donors uh, in hepatitis to see positive recipients, which uh, in kidneys and livers, we've seen uh, good success with that. Brain death, uh, we've learned, uh, causes a tremendous cascade, neurohormonal cascade, which actually injures uh, the organ. There are lots of, uh, the innate immune system is upregulated, and there are now clinical trials uh, specifically uh, targeting some of the chemokines uh, to uh, treat the donor heart, particularly TNF-alpha, uh, either pre-transplant or at the time of uh, implantation. So the first 60 years uh, has witnessed tremendous, tremendous success um, uh, in uh, transplantation of all organs. And that's because we've gotten better at managing patients, gotten better at doing the operation, and have slowly developing uh, uh, better drugs, uh, using less of them, and using multiple drugs to avoid some of the toxicities. Uh, we're now focusing our attention on trying to improve, change the slope, make it less steep uh, in the long term, and need to address the issues of uh, what the B cell is doing, uh, need to address the toxicities of the immunosuppression and address the renal and cardiovascular issues that our patients are, are developing. And I think I'll end there so that maybe we have one second for a question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Evidence for developing chimerism or tolerance. I mean, more than patients, pediatrics mm -hmm. transplanted mm -hmm. later. In That's a very, very good question, and uh, we're we're actually uh, seeing this uh, not by design in some of our patients who come back to clinic. We haven't seen them for three or four years, and they're not taking any drugs, and somehow they coexist 
with their organs. I've seen this particularly in liver transplant uh, individuals uh, where the incidence uh, of uh, what is called operational tolerance, that is uh, having normal histology, no signs and symptoms, normal chemistry, uh, normal function, and on no drugs. And uh, for the adult liver transplant uh, recipients, it occurs about 20% of the time. In children, it seems to occur almost 60% of the time. And uh, Sandy Fang at UCSF has uh, published a paper in JAMA two or three years ago uh, where she withdrew under a protocol immunosuppression from children that had liver transplants, withdrew the drug four years after out and was able to get 60% of them off drug. Uh, and uh, those kids are now uh, five years out uh, from this study and doing uh, very well. Uh, she's uh, expanded that uh, in, in another trial that's uh, ongoing. So clearly there is, um, uh, there are some organs that seem to be uh, in, <laughs> relatively protected from rejection. Now we see it in kidneys, but a lot less. And there may be other issues involved um, uh, related to the architecture of the kidney, the endothelium, and uh, we don't see it uh, as often in hearts. But clearly in liver transplant folk we do. And there are active attempts to try and induce tolerance and induce chimerism where there's coexistence of donor and recipient epitope so that the body doesn't re recognize it as foreign and doesn't attack it. And uh, some of that work has been done at Mass General in Boston and at Northwestern, where patients are given donor bone marrow and then the kidney, and uh, with uh, some success. But that's still a work in progress. Other people are taking a cellular approach using regulatory T cells uh, to disrupt the uh, dysregulation and in giving those to patients. Sorry, no, Ali? No, that, uh, it's on that, along those lines. Um, yeah. Thomas Starzl talked about patients who had stopped taking their medication, and, and he, ne he observed that the thymus tissue or thymus cells had, from the donor had come along and created tolerance. So that, 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 that seems like a really productive avenue. And right. The other question I had for you was the, uh, the regeneration of nerves uh, connected to the heart. I'd love to right. know more about that. Well, the, uh, at one point um, in early heart transplantation, when you did a transplant, the uh, individuals were um, really dependent on volume because they had lost the ability for adrenaline or some of the hormones that come out of the sympathetic connection uh, to the graft. So if you're an athlete, for example, you wouldn't be able to kind of get that extra juice when you wanted to go down that straightaway. But we discovered that with time, it actually uh, grows back. In fact, we've had, have done transplants in professional soccer players who go back to playing soccer. So uh, it's very, very doable. <laughs> Well, the, the right. heart also has parasympathetic. Exactly. So exactly. How does the vagus nerve regenerate to go to the heart? Um, I don't know how it does that. I'm thinking more about the sympathetic side. Obviously, you have the two vagal trunks that go down, and then they send fibers um, uh, to the heart and to the, the GI tract. But um, again, I'm not sure that. Uh, we have the details, but when you do exercise testing and electrophysiologic testing on these patients out of their transplant, uh, while they're not sometimes completely normal, they have evidence of uh, both sympathetic and parasympathetic activity. So what is the current status of the total artificial heart and what percentage of the patients are getting total artificial heart? and placed on anticoagulant therapy? What's that? Uh, very low to zero. <laughs> Not too many. Not too many. Uh, after the uh, Abiocor experience, uh, I think the field kind of uh, pulled back. 
they're doing a lot more animal work, a lot more uh, work in trying to understand uh, the biology, the thrombosis, the inflammatory issues uh, before really uh, charging full steam. Occasionally, uh, it, it is used because you can put it in, but it's temporary. The goal when it came up was as a destination therapy for permanence. But there are centers that will use a total artificial pump uh, occasionally uh, as a bridge if that's all they have till if uh, till a heart comes along. But it's not the Alvad 98% of the time. A short question regarding atherosclerosis of the coronary artery yes. because of this uh, intervention for rejection as well as other therapies. At what uh, rate it is reduced uh, from the original level of high atherosclerosis or uh, the current atherosclerosis? Good question. Two points. The problem is not atherosclerosis. It's animal thickening of the, uh, and smooth muscle wall thickening that reduces the lumen. Whereas garden variety atherosclerosis, where you have a plaque that ruptures within the vessel, is a different pathology. Now, that being said, patients on a lot of these medications do develop high lipid levels. And they're all put on statins and various anti-lipid uh, reducing agents. So clearly, you can develop acquired disease that you and I develop you know, in time, which is atherosclerotic based. But the injury, immune injury, uh, here is not atherosclerotic. OK, well, listen, I, I want to thank you very much, Ali, for coming and bringing your family. And Jonah, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Wynn. And thank you, Ali. Very <laughs>